So like your, your world has fallen apart now. Yep. And, and you also have to deal with the church coming after you. We want to talk about that, but we also want to talk about what are the challenges of rebuilding a life when your whole life has been in, invested in Scientology? Talk about that. Yeah, that's the part that's most most important to me. I think about all of this. Um, okay, so um, so the big, the immediate problem I was faced with in going down this rabbit hole and realizing everything I realized was that I still had every single friend. Uh, not family member, thank God. My parents were on the other side of the country, but they were at least out of Scientology. But my f- my friends, all of them, were Scientologists. I didn't have any non-Scientology friends. So, uh, so I was suddenly like left with the challenge of, okay, now what? Now what do I do? Right? And the woman that I was there for in Minnesota that I'd gone you know across the country to be with. Uh, yeah, she's a Scientologist. In fact, she's a second-gen Scientologist whose family members are the ones paying for the Church of Scientology there in Twin Cities to have their big, beautiful building. So these are fully on board, fully committed people. Uh, she works at the church. I mean, this is not like I can just go, oh, okay, it's all bullshit. And I'm just going to walk away and it's not going to be any big deal. Uh, no, I was fully entrenched in this life. So I had to figure out what to do about that. And I was not in any position to know a damn thing about what I was doing. <laughs> you know, I didn't know anything about cults. I didn't know anything about undue influence. I didn't know anything about critical thinking. I didn't know anything. All I knew was that Scientology wasn't real anymore. Yeah. And somehow. And what's that? Yeah. And so, and so just to tie this to our experience, your identity was gone, right? My identity as a Scientologist sure was, yeah. Yeah, so your identity as a Scientologist is gone. Your marriage was in shambles, right? Well, my marriage had fallen apart, and I was still figuring out the divorce part, and I was starting this new relationship with this other woman. But your your ex-wife or your wife was still in in the church, right? Still in Sea Org, yeah. Yeah, so your marriage fell apart because you left and she stayed, right? Yeah. And well, it fell apart before that because it fell apart while I was out and about all over the country. But, but also while you were deconstructing, right? I oh, mean, yeah. But the church didn't serve your marriage well. <laughs> oh, no, no, it did not. Yeah. Your, your, your marriage in Scientology, especially in the Sea Org, is, is always secondary to the needs of the church. And, and in some ways that can be true in Mormonism because you have these bishops say, hey, your husband isn't being a righteous priesthood holder. You Maybe you want to leave him. And so the family is secondary to the well-being of the church. You said it great. But also like your morality, what's, how do I behave? You know, what's right and what's wrong? That that was now in shambles, right? Because the church had given you your morality, right? In a way, I never really had a crisis of morality. Okay. Um, that's something I've only really been thinking about recently. But, um, but my life, the, more important for me was that my, the, the goals of my life were right. gone. Meaning and purpose you know? in life. Yeah, your, that's what your, was all gone. And your career, right? Because you had your whole career, your education, your career wasn't set up to keep your family strong. It was set up to serve the organization. So once you had left, what's your profession? What's your livelihood? And then more importantly, like you said, what do I now? What am I going to do with my life? Why am I even here? And what is going to get me motivated and how do I pick up the pieces now that that's all falling apart, right? Well, to it, yes. And what I was trying to do was salvage the pieces I still had left in front of me. I hadn't, I hadn't given up on all of it yet, right? Right. I'd given up on Scientology as a belief system, but I still wanted this relationship to work. I still wanted to have a family. And I thought, not knowing anything about what I was up against, that I had a chance. <laughs> you know, if I had known what I was up against, then, then, I, then I think even more of it would have been in shambles, you know. But I was still ignorant of some things, which I needed to learn, which the rest of 2013 taught me. And that was just how ruthless the Church of Scientology will be. And, in how, interwoven, and how interwoven your relationships can be with family and friends and social groups. Because Because whether or not you lost your parents, we'll see. Whether or not you lost your Scientology friends, you lost your wife, but then you had a community, and now you no longer had a community. And those are the biggest things that Mormons struggle with. Does the marriage survive? Does my relationship with my parents survive? Does my relationship with my siblings survive? 
Does my relationship with my friends and my community survive? And if not, how do I pick up with, with my marriage? How do I pick up with friends? How do I pick up with community? And how do I live with compromised relationships with parents and siblings and all the people that are in my life that I care about? Well, exactly. And I, I was not aware yet of the full load that I was carrying Yeah. in this regard, right? I was still, like I said, I was trying to save the relationship. Um, I, 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 had, um, I had given up on Scientology, but I could not say that publicly. I could not say that openly to anybody except my parents. Okay, and why not? believe me, I was on why the not? phone with why my mom you? a lot Why couldn't you time. say that? Why couldn't you be public about it? Because that's very Mormon. Oh, because I would be declared a suppressive person. Which would then, then would mean be, what? What does that mean? Well, I get disconnected. Which means what? That, that I'm disconnected, that I'm, that I'm shunned. I mean, we know what this means. I, I, would, that I was in Minnesota to start my life over again. I had based all of my life on Scientology, so the life I was creating for myself in Minnesota was going to be centered around Scientology still. I was going to go up the bridge. I was going to get a job, preferably with a Scientologist. In fact, when I arrived in Minnesota, that was who I worked for, was a Scientologist. And I was going to have this relationship with a Scientologist. I was going to raise kids in Scientology. Like My whole life was still built around the Church of Scientology. And now the middle had sort of fallen out, but all the structure was still there. And I was the only one who knew where my head was at. Nobody else knew yet. Yeah. And so I'm sitting there going, what the hell am I going to do? Well, I want this relationship. I want this life that I am creating. I just don't want the Scientology component in it anymore. But I can't tell these people that, at least not right now, because they're all hardcore Scientologists. If I start talking to them about L. Ron Hubbard's war records or his college admission, you know, his college grades, or the fact that Dianetics was built on a lie, they're not going to listen to what I have to say, right? And they're going to dump me, and it's going to be very problematic, and the church is going to hear about it, and I'm going to get declared. Well, I don't want any of that to happen. So and then tell I us to... what happens when someone gets declared. Give us well, a little... I'll get there, because I did okay, get okay. declared, so okay, I'll tell good, you all good, about good. it. Okay, Mormons... Yeah, yeah. Post-Mormons are a thousand percent tracking with you right now. So let's keep oh, going. Yeah. This is great. Okay. This so I'm, great. so I'm sitting there stuck with this massive problem. The only person I can talk to, literally the only person I can talk to about all of this is my mom, right? Because she's totally out. You know, my dad still actually believes in some of this stuff. He's out of the church, but he still believes that Hubbard knew what he was talking about in some respects. My mom is like completely where I'm at. In fact, when I learned about the Xenu thing, I watched South Park, I read the materials, and I called my mom and I said, is this really what it is? Because she had done it, you know? And, and she said, yeah, that's really what it is. And I went, God damn, this is crazy. And she goes, yeah. And I said, oh my God. So, you know, so she was able to verify some of this stuff too, because she had gotten higher in, the, in, the, in Scientology than I had. So I'm downloading to her like so much stuff. She's basically taking on the role of a counselor or a therapist for me. What a I'm blessing you had your mom on the same oh, page. I'm, I have been very, very lucky in certain key respects in regards to my experiences with all of this. And yeah. I fully recognize that. Having my parents around still was priceless and i recognize how how rare that is and how what how fortunate i am to have that um i did lose everybody else though and here's yeah. how that happened okay is because okay. i didn't really know what i was doing i didn't know how to talk to them or not talk to them and i wasn't really in a place where i was ready to carry this all out on my own yeah. you know i didn't have an interventionist i didn't have a psychologist i didn't have a therapist i didn't have a cult recovery expert i had none of that stuff yeah. right and i didn't know where to even start looking because the word cult wasn't even really i mean it was there it was around people were talking about it but i didn't totally get what it was yet so that's where all of that research actually started. And I don't remember the exact sequence of it all, but I do remember that I need the first thing I needed to do. And let me just go in sequence of what I did, and we can sort of parse through how this all works in comparison to other people. Here's what I did. The first thing I did was I recognized if Hubbard was wrong 
about all of this stuff, if Dianetics was bullshit and Scientology was bullshit, then what about all the stuff he said about psychiatry? Was that true? And what about all the stuff he said about homosexuals? Was that true? Those were the two things that were actually first on my mind. Because at this time, summer of 2013, George Takai from Star Trek, right? Sulu on Star Trek. He was all over social media talking about being gay and what that means and why gay rights are important and all of this. And this was really big in social media at that time. And I had come out of Scientology where being gay was a, was a mental perversion, a derangement, right? A sickness. And I had believed that. I had swallowed the whole thing. So I was seeing somebody I respected, George Takai. You, are you start, a Trekkie? I'm, are you a, yeah, a, I'm a total sci-fi Trekkie. fan? Oh, yeah. Huge. Okay. Huge, right? So, I mean, you know, Star Wars, Batman, Mar- I mean, yeah, I am a geek, man. You're, my, you're my guy, dude. I'm totally <laughs> right there with you, man. Absolutely. That's a Batmobile. I, I, That's a Batmobile right at the top of you. Yes, right over or there. The Dark Knight, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> got Iron board. Man. You've yep. got one of, one of the Iron Man versions over there. I got the Hulkbuster over here. I got, I got my X-Wing down here. I got, yeah. So <laughs> I played with Star Wars action figures as a kid, too. <laughs> yeah, big time. Me, too. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, Star Trek, George Takai, you know, somebody I'm interested in hearing. And he is saying things that are making a lot of sense. And in fact, and I started reading up on it. I started reading about gay rights, about the LGBT community, about what this stuff actually is. What is transsexuality? What what does that mean? What are people thinking? What are they doing? And I, I was approaching it now from a, I need to learn about this without all the Scientology in the way and just see what's being said. So I did. And the thing that actually sort of turned me you know, or deconverted me or whatever you want to call it away from all of Hubbard's nonsense was when George said (laughs) there was this big thing, you know, about how being gay was a choice. And George Takai had this brilliant thing and they did this survey on the street or something where they started, they ran around asking people, so when did you decide to be straight? Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. And for whatever reason, I mean, it's a good question and it hit me right where I lived in terms of this deciding. It's a decision, right? I needed to understand that that's not what this is. And once I got past that barrier, once that sort of really hit me, I went, oh, okay, I get what's going on here, right? Of course, I never decided. Well, neither did they. And I went, oh. And that kind of did it for me. And then after that, I considered myself an ally and started working in that direction, right, of trying to be a good ally. So, um, so I didn't want to have any, any of that, you know, nonsense lingering in my head. And so I had to sort of deconstruct the Scientology ideas, Hubbard's ideas of what's wrong with being LGBT and sort of break all that down for myself so I could see reasonably that that's just nonsense. So that was the first thing. The second thing was tackling psychiatry. And on that note, You know, psychiatry has a long and bloody and disgusting history, and there's no denying that. And I knew all about it. I was well educated on how bad psychiatry's history was. The lobotomies and and the, you know, just the lobotomies, transverse lobotomies, electroconvulsive shock therapy to gay people. Oh, yeah. And the, and the, the, the drugging and everything else, right? I mean, it's got a pretty sordid past. And it's, and it's not something I'm going to apologize for. Psychiatry has had a, a, a bad history. So knowing all of that, I had to look at, though, well, wait a second. Is that psychiatry now? That was certainly psychiatry in 1950, 1960, 1970. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was not, you know, wildly Great movie. Great exaggerated. Movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? So, um So I needed to look at this, though, and go, well, wait a second. I mean, Hubbard takes it so far as to say psychiatrists are actually evil beings who have existed, who come from the planet Farsec, 
and have existed for Trelania and have been trying to do this entire universe in, right? And I went, Trelania. <laughs> yes. Right? You can't go I with went, millennia. You can't just go with millennia. He's got to go Trelania. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So I'm like, okay, enough, right? This is crazy town. And I dropped all the past life crap and all the psychiatry mumbo jumbo that that science that that Hubbard promotes and that CCHR promotes in Scientology. And I thought, I looked at what are they doing? What are what are their intentions? What's psychology really all about? I went through some books on the DSM. I went through some books on on psychotherapy, and I realized that it's a much much tougher, more nuanced conversation when you talk about mental health and mental health professionals. There are plenty of instances where you can come down on these people for you know malpractice, abuse of power, etc. But there's also lots and lots and lots of instances where people are just trying to do honest, good yeah. work. Try treating to schizophrenia people. without yeah. medication. <laughs> Try treating bipolar without medication. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And I had seen in Scientology people who did suffer from this. And I started realizing I had known and worked with Sea Org members who had undiagnosed PTSD, undiagnosed depression, undiagnosed right. you know, yeah. OCD. And these were real things. These were, actually, these were real conditions that people suffered from. Scientology says it's all bunk. The whole thing is all nonsense. I learned, I started learning more about, you know, some, some neurobiology, just a little bit at the beginning, hardly anything compared to what I know now, but enough to see that I had been sold a bill of goods and it was black and white thinking to paint with this broad brush that all of psychology and all of psychiatry were evil and must be destroyed. And that is what Scientology says about psychology and psychiatry is that they are evil and they must be destroyed. So, and I remember when Tom Cruise said that in his Oprah time where he's speaking yeah. out publicly and he really condemns mental health services. And by the way, Mormonism has a history of doing that as well, but we've softened on that in the past 10 or 20 years. Um, and that's another, another difference between us. Yeah. But exactly. there's still a problem. We still advocate conversion therapy for gay people in an indirect way. So there's still problems. That's right. And Scientology engages, by the way, in its own uh, method of conversion therapy. Uh, in its auditing processes, right. they uh, yeah. claim that they can cure. Jeez. It's all about the symptoms, right? <laughs> yeah. They actually bring it down to. Um, Evil purposes. Remember, I was talking about taking things down to evil purposes and evil yeah. intentions, yeah. and how I had been doing that on the RPF. Well, that's how they deal with people who are homosexuals. They think they have evil purposes against mankind, sex, their their gender, etc. And they uh. will sex check a person, and they will do other kinds of Scientology auditing on a person to get down to the the root cause, quote unquote. I keep using air quotes here of. Uh, where that home, those urges to be a homosexual come from, because clearly, if you have a male body, its only rational urges are to procreate with a female body and vice versa. Yeah. And anything else is a perversion of the natural order. And the thing that somebody actually pointed out to me one day that blew away the entire pretense of Hubbard's nonsense about this is when they pointed out, well, wait a second. If a spiritual entity doesn't have a gender, then why is it so important that they align with the gender of the body that they're born in? How is this in any way such a, you know, why is this such a problem? And of course, it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. You know, there is no logical, rational reason why it would be a problem. It was just Hubbard's nonsense and prejudice. And that's a, that's a problem with Mormonism because our leaders right now are teaching that our spirits have gender. <laughs> so gender, okay, yeah. gender is eternal. They don't. That when you were when Heavenly Father created you in the preexistence as a spiritual being, He assigned a gender in the preexistence before your spirit came to Earth to incorporate a body. So wow, wow. that's why we're okay. stuck. We're stuck in the gender wars. Wow. In, in Mormon. Yeah. No, it's not that. Yeah. In Scientology, it just doesn't make any damn sense. So, okay. yeah. so the point being, I could deconstruct these beliefs. And those were the first two that I tackled wow, because they were cool. the most socially relevant and they were the most relevant to my own recovery. Because if I was going to get help, I was probably going to need some help from psychology. Yeah. And I needed to understand what this was going to do and what this was going to be about. And I needed Why to did get you rid care of about gay? Why did you care about gay people? Because it was socially relevant at the time. It was a big topic of conversation. Okay, because you like so George Takai, of, yeah. you, and you cared about humanity. and Exactly. 
Interesting. And it was a, cool. and it was a raging social issue at the time, as it still is to some degree, yeah. but it was more yeah. so in 2013, I think. Cool. And, okay. Uh, yeah. So, so those, so those being the two first things I tackled. What that then led me to was I thought to myself, okay, I my priority became. I don't want this to ever happen to me again. This is how I talked to myself, right? At the time was, okay, I've, I've, I, this was such a devastating blow to my ego, to my, you know, to my life, to my self-image, to everything. I now, I got to make sure, and, and I, and maybe I was assisted in this by a Scientology belief of, a, there's a particular little Scientology formula that, in, that, that you do when you don't want to ever have something happen to you again. And maybe I was thinking with that a little bit, but I wasn't applying Scientology to the situation. I'm just pointing out that, that maybe, why would I be thinking that way? Well, maybe it had something to do with that. But, um, but I was just naturally thinking that way, that I needed to, to somehow proof myself up against ever letting this happen again. And so I started Googling for how do you, how do you protect yourself thought-wise, right? How do you, what, what, what do you do? And I, and I don't recall what led me to this, but I'll never forget this coming up at the top of the search, of the Google search, Carl Sagan's baloney detection kit. It was actually called the bullshit detection kit. Somebody had posted it under the bullshit detection kit. And I went, I want to know what that is, right? I want to know to be able to tell when I'm looking at bullshit or not. And what is it? It's a chapter from Carl Sagan's book from the demon haunted, the demon haunted world. And it's called the baloney detection kit. And I went, I need to know about that. So I read that chapter. And then I went, I need this whole book. And I knew who Carl Sagan was from a, as a child. He was the guy who did Cosmos. And that was really all I knew about Carl Sagan. I didn't know anything about his critical thinking work. I didn't know anything about his science communication stuff beyond Cosmos. So I read his book. And it was an epiphany. It was, you know, it was a, it was exactly precisely what I needed at that moment. Because Carl Sagan's book, The Demon Haunted World, is basically a manual on critical thinking. And I had been, I was a complete neophyte to the entire topic. Critical, the word, I have not said this through the whole thing, so let me highlight right now that the word critical in Scientology is a bad word. And in if Mormonism. You, <laughs> yeah, if you're critical of L. Ron Hubbard, if you're critical of Scientology, if you're critical of David Miscavige, if you're critical of the organization, if you're critical in general, that means you are a carping critic. You're just snipping and nipping and meh, 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 meh. And that means you have overts. You have moral sins, transgressions that you need to get off your conscience because that's what's causing you to be critical. So being critical, bad word. I, have, I do not believe that that was done by accident. So critical thinking was a new topic for me. And, um, you know, obviously. So I dived all in and I, and I started looking up. I, from this came links to skeptic.com. And then I saw Penn and Teller. And I went, Penn and Teller? Because I had only seen them as magicians and funny magicians on late night TV shows and stuff. I had no idea they were atheists. I had no idea they were skeptics. I didn't know that they promoted skepticism. I didn't know who James Randi was, but suddenly I was learning about him because I was reading about him. And I'm reading about Michael Shermer and I'm reading about Carl Sagan. And I'm like, oh my God, there's a whole community of people here. And they call themselves atheists and skeptics and critical thinkers. And I'm like, huh. This is a world I think I need to become part of because these are not people who are following a guru. In fact, they eschew gurus. They hate gurus, right? These are people who want you to think for yourself. And they don't have some system that they're selling you. They're all winging it. They're figuring it out for themselves. And I went, that's, that's my group. That's the people I need to be talking to right now. And sure enough, this is where I discovered meetup.com. <laughs> <laughs> same time, all in the same Google session, right? And because I'm in, I'm in Twin Cities, I sure as hell can't go talk to Scientologists about any of this. So who am I going to talk to? I have no other friends. I need to do something about this. 
And I hit up on meetup.com. I didn't even know it existed. I knew nothing about social meetups or meeting people on the web or forums or any, I didn't know about any of that stuff. It was all too new to me. So I am crash coursing myself on all of this. And there is a local meetup of a skeptic group called Drinking Skeptically. And they meet once a month at this, uh, at this pub. And I'm like, I want to go meet these people. So I go to it and I'm just sitting there quietly minding my own business, watching these people show up and I'm the stranger there and I'm kind of like, hi, I'm Chris and I'm not saying a whole lot about myself. And I'm just kind of watching to see what's going on. And these people seem nice enough and they're kind of talking about religion and they're talking about this and that. And the guy who heads it, this, this wonderful guy who I still am Facebook friends, Travis, he comes up and sits down with me and he says, hey, what's, you know, what's, who are you? What's, what's, you know, what you doing here? How can I help you? And I start talking to him and I said, well, and this was the first time I actually said these words out loud to anybody. Um, I said, well, I used to be a Scientologist and now I'm not, but I'm still kind of, uh, I still know a lot of Scientologists and I'm just kind of trying to figure things out. And he said, you're what? And a <laughs> smile came on his face, right? He's like, you used to be a Scientologist? And I said, yeah. And he goes, oh. and he looks over at somebody. He goes, he used to be a Scientologist. And he's not teasing me. He's honestly enthusiastic about getting the chance to talk to somebody who was involved in Scientology. And I'm like, not only am I being accepted, this is somebody who wants to talk to me because of this, right? And there's no judgment. All of these people who were there, every one of them, I think, had been involved in a religion before and had come out of it and had some concept of what that was like. So I actually felt almost immediately, once I started interacting with these people, that I was in the right place that I was in the right, that I had found the people who were going to really understand something about what I had just experienced. And you know what? I was right. And again, maybe it was luck. I consider it that, that I'm somewhat fortunate that I just landed in this place at the, at the exact right time that I did. But I sat down there with Travis and he just asked me all these questions and I started downloading. And once I started, it was kind of hard to stop. And when we got to the time when I said, and then I joined the Sea Org, his face drops again. He goes, what? You, you, you were in the Sea Org? Like he kind of had known something about this stuff, but he didn't really know a whole lot about it. And he was just so enthusiastic. So I'm telling him my story and he's just loving every minute of it. And he's so thankful that I'm there and people are kind of gathering around and, and there's smiles and there's laughing and there's people who are joking with me and, and they're just accepting who I am and who I had been and the fact that I could change out of that. And that, there really is, wow, I can't believe I'm actually like, okay. You're getting emotional. I, I hadn't, yeah, I haven't thought about this one in a while. Um, that was priceless. That's what I was so lucky about, is that I landed at a place where people were accepting. They weren't judgmental. And I, again, I just kind of lucked out that I, that I found the one skeptic meetup in, in Minnesota, that, you know, Minneapolis, that I could go to, and I went to it, and the people there were just perfect. You know, and there was nobody giving me a hard time. There was nobody like asking me weird questions about Xenu and stuff. I was just telling them, I, you know, what, what I've told you. So can I, can um, I just pause you for a second? Yeah, That's go ahead. so beautiful. I'm so emotionally connected to what you're sharing. And just so you can see through our side of the window, the reason why I've done workshops and retreats every year for post-Mormons, um, and the reason why we're doing Thrive, and the reason why we've created these Thrive local support groups where in twin cities hopefully someday there'll be a, a a thrive group for healing beyond mormonism where where people questioning mormonism and hopefully someday any religion can come to a little support group in whatever city they're in or whatever town they're in or suburb they're in and be able to find people that either are going through it or who have been through it 
who can look at them in the eyes and say, you're not crazy, you're not alone, you're awesome, and then here you can make it through this and, and we'll be there to help you. I just want you to know when you hear Blah Blah Thrive, you Blah Blah workshops and retreats, that's what we've been trying to do on our end so that more people can have experiences like the one you had. And that is that is the best thing I think can possibly be done for people newly coming out of these groups. Yeah, yep. Sure as hell worked for me. Yeah. And I wasn't even, you know, looking for therapy. I was just looking for people to talk to yeah. and make friends with. I'm so you know? glad you found that. Oh, God, me too. Um, so again, perfect, right? Perfect con- conflation of circumstances. And so that got started giving me the idea that there were people outside of the church that I could be friends with. Yeah. People who were not going to be judgmental and people who were truly interested in and, and kind of just enjoyed having me around. Cause after I told my story, you know, I started interacting with them on a, on a human level and just like, Oh, well, who are you? And what have you? Blah, blah, blah. And we talked about nonsensical stuff and it was fine. Current events, news, you know, it, religion in general, everybody in the room was pretty down on religion in general. And that was kind of, you know, where I needed to be at that moment. Cause I needed again, that polar opposite view. And I needed to enmesh myself in that for a while to kind of clear my head of all this stuff, right? If you think this, this is like a pendulum swing kind of thing. And this is, this is the, uh, the, what I needed. And it was exactly what I was getting. I continue to talk. Oh, can I, can I just with, say one more thing really quick? Yeah, yeah. Uh, isn't it, wasn't it amazing if, if you were like us, you were, you talked about this in your last episode that how did you refer to non-Scientologists? What were the, the terms? Huh? Wogs. And tell us again what that stands for. Well, it doesn't stand for anything. It's a, okay. it's a, it's a um, British derogatory term. It's a racial epithet, actually, is what yeah. it is at this point. Um, and yeah, that's it's wogs. But, you but know, Jews, wogs. I think Jews call non-Jews goyim. You know, you know, Mormonism just says m- members and non-members. But you always grow up with this exceptionalism that you and the people in the church are are God's chosen and everybody outside's inferior. Can you talk about what your awakening was like as you started seeing what wogs were really like? Yeah, that was actually, that's, that's, that's what was so special and cool about this whole experience was I was, I was getting more compassion and understanding from these people, total strangers to start with than I was from the people who were in the church who had known me for decades. And now we're now, you know, uh, I was, I was experiencing um, the cold shoulder, I guess you could say from the church of Scientology <laughs> uh, during this time. And it was, and, and there's some details I'm not going into because it just takes too long to explain, yeah. but there was, there was rockiness with the church and I was trying to, you know, put up a good show stay in good standing, keep this relationship going. But internally, I, you know, I, I, it was a black and white situation for me. So um, meaning, you know, Scientology was all this and I was kind of not all that anymore. But I was still trying to put on this, this show of it. I had also, by the way, in order to start downloading and and get some relief, kind of open the vent a little bit, uh, the steam vent, I guess you could say. Uh, I had started posting in some forums. There was an an, there was an ex Scientology message board, which was a forum group for people to just talk. Right. I created a sock account on that, an anonymous account, and I called it I Hate Duplicity. On what <laughs> was platform? My name. What platform was it? Ex Scientology message board. It was um, it was uh, uh, forum.exscientology.net or something. I don't know. It was a website. Uh, oh, a website. For, a website. Yeah, it was a website okay. for former Scientologists. Hey, and, by the way, Julie just says that people in the UK use don't use the W word. She says it's like the N word. So I'm yeah, just that's why I tr- Okay, I okay. try to not. My, say I it did a lot. not know that, Julie. I'm. I apologize to all my UK. And any other nationality that views that term as offensive, I apologize. We'll say W word from now on. Fair Make enough. I yeah. Uh, yeah, I have to say the word to get it across what the word is. Yeah. Because it's not rec- generally thought no of that idea. way in the United States. But I do get that. And I try to minimize okay. my use of it for that reason. And thank you, Julie, for, for letting us know. We I, did, yeah. I, I literally had no idea that was a bad word anywhere. So 
Okay. Yeah, no, I said it's a racial okay. epithet. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't yeah. realize. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Okay. So um, what was I saying? Um, so you are, um, you realize that, that uh, people outside of the church were actually could be really amazing people. Oh, yeah, exactly. And so, and the church has given me trouble of, of one kind or another. Like I said, they're giving me the cold shoulder, trying to sort that out. And um, they're starting what, to be suspect, suspicious oh, of you, right? Yeah. Well, I'm posting. I'm yeah. posting oh, stuff on, on this. Right? Oh, talking, yeah. Okay. But I'm talking anonymously on these ex Scientology I, websites. Yes. With other ex Scientologists. Right. That's, there was yeah. exmormon.com. Now it's the ex Mormon Reddit. There's Facebook groups. There's the Mormon Stories podcast community. But there are all these ways that ex religious members or questioning religious members have a way to communicate to build community, to support each other, to disseminate information, right? Exactly. Yeah. And um, and that's what this message board was. Um, I wasn't yet aware of the Facebook groups or that there were Facebook groups about this stuff. I just knew that there was the ex-Scientology message board and there was Tony Ortega's blog, which is called The Underground Bunker. And Tony Ortega is a journalist. He's never been a Scientologist, but he has been reporting on Scientology for years. And he's got a whole blog dedicated to it. And every day he's posting new stories. And I was just entranced by it at this point, because it had been an incredible source of information for me. And one of the first things I'd found um, in my descent down the internet rabbit hole of, of truth about Scientology. So, so Tony Ortega's blog has a community, a discus forum of comments of regular contributors on his blog. So that itself was also kind of a community of people that I was talking to. But I was doing it anonymously. I was not letting anybody know anything about me or about my situation, or at least I was trying not to, because I was aware of the fact that the church monitors these boards and watches them and watches to see who's popping up and who's saying what and where. And they try to figure out who you are based on what you're saying. And I did not really appreciate how much effort the Church of Scientology puts into that. They are very dedicated to knowing who their enemies are. So I was posting stuff and I got bolder and bolder until finally there was a story that actually contained some information about somebody that I used to work with directly. And I basically said too much. I said, oh, I know this person. I, this person used to be my junior or something. Now, how I you know, ever imagined that the church wasn't going to connect two and two and, and get four I don't know, but I, you know, was, was maybe I maybe subconsciously didn't even care anymore. I don't know, but I do know that I said too much. And I was told later by somebody from the church that this is how they figured out who I was. And, uh, and so I contributed to this thing with Tony uh, on his article with my comment and, uh, and they figured out who I was. Now it took them a few months to do before I found out about that. So I'm still thinking that I'm, you know, flying under the radar, that they don't know that I'm out of the church, that I don't really want to do Scientology anymore, but I'm still maintaining these relationships. And uh, what happened was my girlfriend went down to Clearwater to do some training. This is like October now of 2013. She went down to FLAG because uh, that's what they do with staff members from time to time is they get them all together to do this training. That was going to be this great big release that was, that was going to happen, and she needed to get trained for it. While she's down there, she tells me a little bit about what she's involved in. I then, you know, post some of that. Again, anonymously, I'm not naming her. I'm not naming me. I'm trying to keep it surreptitious, but I'm kind of an idiot because I'm just kind of not really thinking about how focused the church is on leaks, and I'm giving them a leak. And so um, I then... So she, they tell her down in Florida um, that I am not a very good person. And she's confused about this. They know that we're friends and she's like, okay. And so she calls me and says, have you been posting online? And I said, oh, busted. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I posted a couple things and she's like, well, you need to stop. And I go, yeah, I guess I do. And so I swore that I wouldn't. 
And I wanted to make good with the church and I wanted to make up my, the damage that I had done by posting anonymously against the church. Like this is, they were now coming down on me. They had figured it out and they were gonna, and they were coming after me now. And they took her phone and I did not hear from her again until she came back or actually until she wrote me a letter, which I'll get to. So all of October, all of November, it's radio silence. And what happened was they had taken her phone and they had found all of our text messaging and they had busted her for consorting with, you know, suppressive elements because that's what the church now thought of me as. And you don't know when they declared that, right? No, they just, I just know that they, they had been figuring things out behind the scenes and they had not been telling me about it or contacting me or asking me for clarification. They had just been putting this file together of all of my postings and stuff. And this is what they do is they monitor all the boards and they try to figure out who people are. Yeah. I mean, this is tell you and Mormons need to understand the Mormon church has a, has an organization called the strengthening the membership committee or the strengthening the members committee. And they have people monitoring Facebook groups, chat rooms, internet groups, private conversations, they're collecting files on people, and then they're sending files to bishops, encouraging excommunication as a way to track and control people's behavior. So and, Mor- Mormons well, have that. And, and I, now, I now am aware that the church is hiring social media experts who take that to the very next level um, including spying on people, uh, to be able to gather intelligence like a military organization would do so that they can make sure and, and uh, control and have influence on its members. And I've talked to people who, in church headquarters, their job was to monitor and track me as a podcaster. So Yeah, so, well, that's, and that's just more destructive cult bullshit, you yeah. know. I mean, you know, when you're when you're an above the boards operation, you just don't have to do crap like that. Right. That's Since right. when is a church an intelligence organization? You know, and the Church of Scientology has an entire wing of their of the church at the Sea Org level called the Office of Special Affairs, and that's all they do is this kind of crap, right? As well as the legal stuff and and executing fair game operations where they do the stalking and the harassing. But they do the stalking and harassing based on all the spy work they're doing in their intelligence division. Right. They literally have a whole division that is the intelligence division. Unbelievable. And this is a church, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, yeah. So it's stuff like that that I just go, no, man, Mormons, they're still way, way behind the curve. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, so they know about me. They know and your about your friend's my been silenced. I now know that they know. Okay, this is no, this is, uh, I think, late October or early November. Now I've figured out that they know, and I know I'm in trouble. I've been trying to fly under the radar, but I've been too pissed. My posts have been pretty, you know, like I was really letting loose on a couple of them. But again, anonymously, I didn't know exactly what I had said that they had figured out was me, but I knew that I had had, had screwed up. And so um, I contacted the local Minnesota church. And I said, I'd like to come in and talk to somebody because um, I need to sort this out. And uh, I wanted, all I wanted to do, all I wanted to do, right? I didn't want to lie to them anymore or put on a false front anymore, but I did want to get my questions addressed because I had many of them after all this stuff that I had learned. And I wanted to avoid becoming being labeled as a suppressive person. That was only, that was the only goal I really had at this point. You know, I didn't want to continue being a Scientologist really, but I didn't want to be labeled a suppressive because that meant all these people would have to disconnect from me. So I called them up in good faith and I said, I want to talk, you know, can we sort this out? And what they did, and this really surprised me, is uh, I show up, I get, I get told, okay, come to the church on Sunday night. It's a, it's a Sunday evening. Nobody else will be there. And I show up thinking I'm going to talk to this local OSA representative. Uh, her name was Karen. And I, she was there. But so were two Sea Org members that they had flown out from Los Angeles to deal with me. That Whoa. I did not see coming. Really? And these were two people that I had known, that I had worked with. 
right? There was this ethics guy, and then there was this woman from, out, from the Office of Special Affairs. Her name was Pam. And I don't think I can be unbiased about talking about this, right? This is all from my point of view. Um, but these OSA people, man, these guys have shark eyes. I, I don't know how else to describe it. Like, they just don't have any feeling here. There's just nothing here. And so she's sitting down across from me at this table. And I say, okay, I've got a lot of questions I'd like to get answered. Um, you know, what about this? And I throw out this question. She completely ignores it, completely ignores it and says, uh, you know, you're this, 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 and this. You have to do this and this and this and this and this. And that's how it's going to be, right? And I'm like, no, I want my questions answered, right? Bop, bop, bop. And I'm nervous. My stomach is, butterflies are practically flying out of my throat. I'm actually confronting a Scientologist Sea Org member who is in the Office of Special Affairs. And I'm point blank saying, what about L. Ron Hubbard's war record? What about his, you know, failing out of college? Like, I, I, like how come I wasn't told these things, right? And she is not having any of it. She will not address my questions. She just keeps repeating that I'm an, uh, 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 she used a lot of Scientology terminology, which I won't repeat here. She basically just said, I have, I'm a failed Scientologist. I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but I'm a failed Scientologist who never really got it in the first place. And I got a lot of work to do and I need to come crawling back to them so that they can sort this out. Or what? Well, that's what comes next, yeah, right? Yeah. I actually get so mad. Yeah that she will not answer even one of my questions that I stand up and I just go, fuck this. I'm fucking through with this. Do you this. think and she I, had I, the answers? Cause the Mormon equivalent of this is when the Bishop or the stake president calls you in to kind of threaten you with, with the disciplinary council or excommunication, but the stake presidents and the bishops don't know all the problems with the church. Oftentimes. Do you think these, these people were actually aware of the problems? Probably not. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. I suspect to this day that she definitely had some idea of what I was talking about and could have addressed some of those questions had she so chosen. Right. This was the woman who was um, personally involved in covering up the death of somebody who had died while they were doing the uh, purification program in Scientology. That's the sauna detox program. Wow. She was the one who had ordered me to give her everything I had written and typed and whatever about that incident. She took everything, shredded it all, covered it all up. So this was a woman who was aware of the fact that there was destructive activity in the church and was on the side of people who were covering it up. Yeah. Right. This was, that was this woman. So, so she had been the one who was flown out to deal with me. Right. Every religion so I, has its fixers, its hammers, yeah, it's people that exactly. are made to solve problems and their money, their status, their reward is can they effectively solve problems, get rid of problems without them becoming major stories or eruptions or embarrassments for the church. Exactly. She was a fixer. So yeah. she was there to fix me. Yeah. And I wasn't having it. So I got up and walked out. And I was ready to just get out the door. I mean, I was mad. I was angry. I was uh, sad. I was almost crying. I, my, like I said, my stomach was just doing flippy floppies. I, it, was, it was very nerve wracking for me, right? Um, but I had done it. I had stood up to them. And then, so there's the salt and then there's the sweet. So this guy comes up, right? Who I had also worked with. Now he had he it's had good not cop, been bad cop, right? Good cop, bad exactly. cop. Exactly. Yeah. He had not been in the room. He had seen me walk out, and he came after me, and he said, "Okay, let's talk." And he was really chill. And I said, "You know, I I said okay because I wanted to salvage the relationships, and I knew that if I walked out of that building, it was all over." And the woman that I loved would be out of my life forever. And this new family that I was trying to create with her parents and her siblings and all that, all of that was going to be gone. Like every reason I was in Minnesota was going to be gone. I didn't want that to happen. I wanted to make this work. So I sat down with him 
And I said, what do you got? Right. And he said, okay, well, you're going to have to, basically what he, what we came down to was he said, you know, look, you don't want this to go that direction. You know, you need to acknowledge that you've committed suppressive acts. That's what Scientology calls it when you buck the church. And, um, and you need to, you know, and we need to sort this out. And I said, okay, well, I said, I don't want to get declared a suppressive. And he said, you don't, you don't have to. He said, but you're going to have to do these steps as though you were declared a suppressive. In Scientology, if you are declared a suppressive person, that's not necessarily the end of the line for you. There are a series of steps called the A to E steps. A, B, C, D, E. They are outlined in a policy letter that L. Ron Hubbard ostensibly wrote that tells you, you got to do this and this and this and this and this. And after you're done with all these steps, we will take away the declare order and you will no longer be a suppressive person. In the 27 years that I was in Scientology, I saw two people do these steps and get back in the church's good graces. So I knew it was possible to do it. And I knew I was motivated enough to do it. And I knew I didn't care about Scientology as a belief system anymore, but I could still do these steps and get back in the church's good graces so that I could have these relationships. That was the only reason this was all happening. So I agreed to do them because that would make it, I thought, that I would still be able to maintain my relationships. And I started doing these steps. Yeah, and in Mormonism, that's called uh, being disfellowshipped or being on probation. And then they give you steps or conditions to be able to be, and it means you can't talk in church or you can't pray in church and you can't, there are all these, you can still pay money, but but there are all these sanctions and restrictions until the point where you've met this criteria and then you're reinstated. Okay. Yep. So same, same. The hoops you have to jump through to go through the A to E steps will probably take the average person a year or two. Um, it involves a lot of money and, and time uh, making amends to the church, doing amends projects, they call them. Like, let's say I might have to go out and pass out you know, a thousand way to happiness booklets, and I might have to do community service of some kind, and I might have to, you know, um, you, like you can't really be associated with the church or with any Scientologists, you see, because you're, you know, most of the people who are doing these A to E steps are declared suppressive people. So they're disconnected. They have to do it all outside of the church. Well, that would be the same for me. I couldn't go in the church and do this stuff, but I was kind of have to figure it out. And I was willing to do that until December 11th, 10th. I think it was December 10th. Uh, I'm at work and I've been doing the ADE steps. I finally got step A. I believe I got it approved, which was basically just a write up that I'm going to be a good chicken and I won't keep posting about Scientology on the internet and I'll shut up and I'll be a good person and I'll do what you want. I had basically gotten that step approved and was going to move on to my next one or I was in the middle of that when a letter arrives to me uh you know the post through the post and it's a letter from this woman that i was with she was still down in clearwater i had not heard from her in, in a month and a half and it was a disconnection letter it was basically telling me um that we were over you know uh that um, she didn't want to hear from me or talk to me ever again. And that's how it was. And even if I got through these steps, wouldn't matter. We were done. And after I got finished crying my eyes out, um, I said, okay. So the one thing that I'd been doing all this for really in the end um, was taken away. And I had jumped through all these hoops. I had, I had, I had, I had stopped posting on the internet for, you know, since they had told me to, and I was trying to honestly do this stuff to comply with what the church of Scientology wanted from me. And, um, they took everything away anyway. Well, I was in the middle of that. So I didn't really see any reason to continue with any kind of anything with it. And I said, I wrote to the guy who, who, by the way, had sat down 
across from me and told me with a smiling face that if I do these steps, everything would be fine. That guy, right, was the one who I was now working with on these steps. And um, that and another guy, right? And I wrote him and I, and I knew him being a Sea Org member, second generation, having grown up in Scientology, just like I had, being a total hardcore believer, he was not going to listen to anything I had to say. So I, I didn't even try to, you know, give any zingers or one-liners or try to hit him with any truth or anything. I just said by email to him, I'm not doing these AD steps anymore. You've, you've, you know, you forced this disconnection to happen and I no longer have any interest in Scientology. I'm done. A week later. Okay, so the disconnection call. again meant that someone that you cared about was told they couldn't connect with you. Yeah, she was out of my life now. And you felt you felt like, hey, if I do these steps, they're not going to disconnect people from me. So they kind of... But no, because they said, he specifically said, you are not declared a suppressive person. You're right. not a suppressive person. We are not going to treat you like a suppressive person. Okay. Okay. But you are going to have to do these steps that a okay. suppressive person would do. Now, that's weird. Yeah. And I knew that was weird because yeah. that's not how the church operated in the past. But yeah. now this is how they're operating. And what I came to learn is they don't like declaring people anymore with an actual official notice. Yeah. Because people were posting them on the internet and they, and it's libel. I mean, there's like, actual, you know, it's what they write about you when they write up these declare orders is slanderous. It's bad. You know, they, 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 they they character assassinate you and they post, they used to post it on a notice board where everybody could read it. Now they don't. Now they keep it on file secretly and they don't, I've never seen my declare order, you know? So I was trying to prevent that from happening. And I was told, you are not suppressive. We're not declaring you. Right. So I thought, because it's hardly an irrational or unreasonable assumption, that I would not be disconnected if I did these steps. And I was honestly playing ball with them. Jumping through their hoops. Yeah. Right? I didn't care about any of this stuff, but I did care about my relationships. Yeah. And I was, I was like, okay, these guys will do Scientology and I will you know, sort of, you know, we'll gradually work this out. But no, the church wasn't, wasn't down with that. So I was an enemy and I needed to be dealt with. And so she needed to disconnect from me and that's how it went down. And so she disconnected from me from Florida. I was devastated again. Yeah. You know, because everything I had been working for, for the, for, you know, we had been involved for like, you know, two years at this point. I mean, all of 2012 was basically me leaving the Sea Org and 2013 was me showing up in Minnesota and trying to create a new life with her. So she disconnects. I say, okay, I'm done. So a week later, I think it was the 17th or 18th of December, I get a phone call from that guy. His name was Lon. And he said, well, you're declared a suppressive person. And I said, thank you. I know. Got it. Thanks for confirming. I said, when am I ever going to get a copy of the declare order so I can see what it is you've declared me for? He said, no, it's on file here in HCO, uh, their offices, right? And I said, okay, well, it's been nice knowing you. Bye. Hmm. And I hung up. And uh, honestly, I felt pretty good. This is the equivalent to Mormon excommunication, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What you're I describing mean, is what I experienced when they excommunicated me, I think. Okay. Well, yeah. what happened was I stood there in the snow in Minnesota. I think I was out playing D&D. And I, I, like, I had started playing D&D again. <laughs> I'd started meeting friends, making, you know, once I saw meetup.com, I was like, oh my God, there's other groups. I'd actually started creating a social life for myself. I had the skeptics now, and I was starting to get into the gaming community again. I was an avid D&D player when I was a young kid before I'd gotten involved in Scientology and stuff. So I was kind of returning to my roots in a lot of ways in, in coming into the real life again. And I was kind of, I was in all about critical thinking and learning about that stuff. But I was also into, what can I do to have fun? 
oh yeah, gaming. And I started doing that. So I think I was in a game when I got the phone call. So I went outside, took the call, and I'm standing outside and I'm declared a suppressive person now. And I guess the thing about it that I found relieving was I literally, the exact thought that I had was, that monkey is off my back now. Yeah. Like, it was, it was, you know, there was the awfulness of losing the relationships, but I'd had a week already to kind of process that. And I'm not saying at all that I was over it. That's not what I'm trying to say or infer or imply. Right. I was very far from over it. Yeah. And I'll go into some more detail about that. What I mean is that this was a separate thing. This was the church on my head. Yeah. And, you know, for a while that had come off of my head for a bit, but it was always still present because I had to toe the line. I had to not say anything publicly in my own name. I had to, you know, play nice. I had to do all this stuff. And now all of that, all 28 years of it was over, permanently over. Like when you're declared, that's like, that's a big thing. It's not a small thing. Those A to E steps are not a hop, skip and a jump. And I knew I was never going to go back to do those ADE steps. And I knew that I knew it was a con and it was, a, and I was done with it. So now I knew that they were done with me. You know, like I didn't really think about the fair gaming and stuff that would happen because I didn't think about the fact that I was going to go be an internet critic. That was not part of the picture yet. Right. So I was just me trying to set my life up again, hit, having hit the reset button. And now here I was basically hitting it again without any Scientology in my life. Like there's like, I'm not a Scientologist anymore. It is totally official. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, so it was like an albatross off my neck, you know, it was a monkey off my back. That's yeah. how I felt. And it was, and it felt good. I smiled. I laughed. I thought, damn, this is kind of cool. And I went back and played my game and, let me ask you, know, you went on with my life. Let me ask you for a lot of Mormons, ex Mormons, you know, excommunication, I'm, I'm almost considering it a sacrament in a sorry, in a bit of a tongue in cheek way, because it's rare that the church actually excommunicates someone these days, because we've made it so painful for the church to do it. We're now showing up with 100 people, we're live streaming it on Facebook Live. Several of us have actually recorded the excommunication processes, and then shared them on the internet. Jeremy Runnels did that. And so, you know, Bill Real did that. And so we, we've made it really painful. So excommunication is quite rare. It happens, but it's rare. What's more common are for people to leave the church and then want to remove their name from the church. So they resign from the church and have their names taken off the records. I'm just curious, is there a way for a Scientologist to resign from Scientology? Without uh, yeah. having to be declared a subversive person? Well, they'll probably end up being declared anyway if they do it this way. But yeah, you can just write a letter to the Church of Scientology. In fact, all ex-members should um, that says, I officially resigned from the Church of Scientology. I'm no okay. longer a Scientologist, right? And then because they'll declare that, you a subversive person. Well, that removes you from the legal obligation to have to consider yourself a Scientologist or be in any way, shape, or form subject to the policies of the Church of Scientology, which I found kind of interesting. But um, anyway, that's a, that's a thing. But, but like they did with me, you know, they've now established a system where they don't have to declare you. And so they don't. They just tell everybody you're not in good standing. You shouldn't be talking to that guy anymore. If you do, if you're connected with him in any way, then you will be declared as well, right? According to church policies. And so, but not as well, sorry, but you will be like shunned, basically. It's a bit more informal now. It's weird, right? The church policies are crystal clear about this. And because of all the bad PR, the church has decided that Hubbard's policies on this matter are not, don't need to be followed anymore. And instead, what they do is they informally declare you, right? So, and then it's the same, in effect, though, it's the same thing. And if you think it's any different, we'll just look at what happened to me and you'll see it's not any different, you know? So that's kind of how it goes now. And it's exactly for the same reason. You know, we've had recordings released 
of ethics officers in Scientology who are telling people that they're being declared uh, and that sort of thing, too. So it's all been exposed and the church is always, you know, embarrassed by it, what it actually does to people.